Very glad to be here. You know, we're shifting our, our gaze to, to addiction today. This topic for me is something that I'm in, I'm in the middle of a process with. You know, our, our next film is about this. And the title of this presentation is Constructing and Deconstructing the Mythology of Addiction. Now, that's not what it says in the program, okay? Uh, and I'm sorry, Kane, you know, but as, as, as we continue to work on this thing, it sort of took on a, uh, a, different, a bit of a different lens than what he had, we had originally uh, framed it as, but I think it's consistent with what, why we're here and, uh, and what we need to be talking about. So. I'm here today because of a journey that began with a movie you may have heard of, it's called Healing Voices. Uh, a journey which has brought countless lessons and ultimately evolved into our next film, Recovering Addiction, a public health rescue mission. Our, our goal with these films is to explore what we view as problematic and often oppressive social narratives. In order to deconstruct them and, re and reassemble them in meaningful ways that we hope will help improve the public health of our communities. Reawaken was organized around the core themes of mental health, trauma, and addiction. Now, each of us in this room have our own unique relationship to these experiences, and we're gathered here to create meaningful action intended to shift existing systems or constructs that we believe are broken and often harmful. However, in order to do so, we must reflect on how these paradigms have been built, shaped, and perpetuated over time. Mental health, trauma, and addiction do not exist in isolation. They do not exist in the silos that they have been placed in by society and culture, by industry and bureaucracy and our institutions. They are intrinsically linked, naturally occurring extensions of our human experience. They exist within us and within our relationship to the world. They do not belong in temples built by men. Some of the temples which house addiction are made of brick and mortar. They have been constructed over time to remedy and contain and manage problematic behavior, so-called. They do not make even the slightest attempt to understand addiction as a meaningful human experience. They are mechanisms of control, extensions of our paternalistic, authoritative, social norms. Other of these temples are ideological. They exist to frame the experience of addiction as a problem of the individual, a failing, moral or otherwise, a disease which must be cured, a consequence of substances with hooks and teeth which ensnare us, lest we abstain. These temples do not frame addiction as a problem of social context, or oppression, or lack of opportunity, or disconnection. This ideology shames and blames and punishes people for their behavior. Instead of seeking to interpret its meaning and what it might reflect about the unsustainable condition of many people's lives. A little editorial note here. I say temples built by men. Now, maybe, maybe if these temples were built by women, yes. we wouldn't be so far fucked. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> in order to change our current condition, in order to do less harm, in order to keep people alive, in order to honor their experience of this world and reawaken a sense of agency and community and meaningful support, we must understand how these temples were built, if only to destroy them. Much has been said over the past few days in workshops, in keynotes, in our shared time and conversations about mental health and about trauma. Now, I view what we refer to as addiction in direct relationship to both of these things. They are brothers from another mother. So as we shift our gaze to addiction specifically, I believe it's important to maintain a wide-angle lens and always maintain that mental health, trauma, and addiction cannot be parsed out. They are one. I know you know this, my friends in this room, you know this in your head and you know this in your hearts. And it feels good to be here in this way, amongst like-minded travelers. But unfortunately, we are the outliers, for now. These are not the conversations that our communities are having. They are the conversations that our communities must be reawakened to. So, 
Let's explore where our cultural ideology comes from in my country, imperialist America. <laughs> Addiction is a sane, protective response to suffering. A messenger delivering, often harshly, deep truths about the conditions of our lives. Our colleague, Dr. Gabor Mate, says that addictions begin in pain and they end in pain. Now, the latter part of this is widely accepted because we know all too well the trauma, the carnage, and the chaos that can arise from addiction, wreaking havoc on our health, on our families, on our relationships, on the entirety of our social ecosystem. And so the part about addictions ending in pain, that is socially acceptable. But how they begin, where this behavior comes from, why it contains deep and often profound meaning, that is lost on us as a culture. And it's not necessarily our fault. This is a message that has been built over time. And there are many external forces at play. Let's start by considering this. In 1914, the US Congress passed the Harrison Act, banning opiates and cocaine. And by 1918, the United States implemented alcohol prohibition and became a dry nation. That did not mean, however, that people stopped using any of these drugs. Let's be real. Humans have been consuming mind-altering substances for a variety of reasons for basically all of recorded history. We cannot in good faith truly believe that these substances can be eradicated from society. Alcohol prohibition did not last, in part because of how much white people love to drink, <laughs> and the overwhelming culture of violence that ensued during, during its prohibition era. The prohibition of illicit drugs, however, continued as a convenient social and political tool, an extension of minority and opposition suppression whose lineage can be clearly traced in American history, in American policy, dating back to the emancipation of slavery. This guy, he played a major role in how this evolved from a public relations perspective. As head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in 1930, he embarked on a mission not only to criminalize, but to demonize illicit drug use through federally funded public health education campaigns, like this one. Media and PR campaigns like Reefer Madness drove a hysteria around people's perception of drugs and drug users as inherently dangerous influences that would corrupt their children, their communities, and society at large. It's easy to look back on the absurdity of this messaging, but in truth, it laid the groundwork for our deeply embedded modern thinking and for increasingly punitive drug policies that disproportionately impacted non-white people. This continues to today. Illicit drugs and drug use became increasingly synonymous with the counterculture and were specifically considered a plague of minority communities. It's also worth noting that drug prohibition gave rise to the illicit drug trade. This is Arnold Rothstein, the OG of narcotics. His ruthless control of this new black market industry was a staging ground for the endless violence that to this day defines drug trafficking. To quote Johann Hari's book, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs, today there's an Arnold Rothstein on every block in America. But let's not forget that the primary consequence of drug prohibition was not safer, healthier communities. It was violence. Moving forward into the 1940s and 50s, the Skinner Box laboratory experiments were used to substantiate that drugs were, indeed, dangerous chemical hooks that would be consumed over and over and over again, regardless of their negative consequences, often until death. There's going to be a lot more on this later tonight when we talk about recovering addiction. We're going to talk all about Rat Park. Notice, that rat's not in a park. <laughs> In the late 1960s, as the civil rights movement and the dismantling of Jim Crow laws visibly deepened existing racial tensions in much of the United States, then-presidential candidate Richard Nixon deployed what is known as the Southern Strategy, intended to increase political support amongst white voters. Here is a quote from one of his advisors. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin 
and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Thus began what has evolved into the modern day war on drugs. A prohibition campaign led by the federal government with a stated intention of reducing the illegal drug trade in the United States. Today, the Drug Policy Alliance estimates that the U.S. spends $51 billion annually on this initiative. In 2017, over 70,000 people died of overdose-related deaths in the United States alone. Consequently, this has given rise to mass incarceration. The U.S. state and federal prison population has increased over 800% in 40 years. Also in 2017, there were 2.3 million individuals incarcerated in the land of the free. One in five who are locked up on drug charges. The numbers are staggering. So, now that we have a general sense for a relative social history of drugs in the United States over the last hundred years at least, is it any wonder that our social and cultural relationship, both to drugs and to drug users, can be classified as problematic at best? There is no room in this equation to explore the reason why so many of us choose to alter our minds with substances. There is no compassion for addiction. We shame drug users. We castigate drug addicts as morally deficient, as weak, as fundamentally flawed, dysfunctional, and broken. We put them in cages. We punish them for their pain. And there is no justice in this. There is no search for meaning in this experience. Instead, we rely on the same temples that have paved the path which led us here. The jails, the courts, the treatment systems, the dogmas of morality, of abstinence, and disease to somehow pave the way out. And meanwhile, in this very same culture, we see images like this. And this. I want to point something out. His baseball glove is in the wrong hand. <laughs> Maybe, instead of giving him a little Johnny ADHD medication over here, his fucking dad should have shown him how to put the glove on the right hand. <laughs> <laughs> and this, it's horrific. And the irony is humbling. The imaginary line between illicit and illicit. The ways in which we perceive one drug versus another. This is a wash in layers of capitalism. <clears throat> Let's bring it back to Dr. Gabor Monte, who says, it's impossible to understand addiction without, without asking what relief the user finds or hopes to find in the drug or the addictive behavior. For me, this rings true. And I hope it does for you as well. I'd like to build a bridge to our exercise. Um, and I hope this exercise will allow each of us an opportunity to reflect compassionately on some of the things that we consume uh, in the course of our day-to-day -day lives and may have complex, often complicated relationships with. And the bridge I'd like to build is a story I call the case of Major. So <clears throat> I was in Chicago on business, and I was in a bar having a hamburger, as often I am, at uh, you know, 10, 10 o'clock at night when I'm, when I'm traveling on the road. Uh, this guy sat down next to me. He was served a hamburger, and he was eating this thing like it was the greatest gift he had ever been given. I just looked over, I said, man, you're really loving that hamburger. And he looked, he looked up, and just started chatting. I thought he was just some dude. He was homeless, crack addict from the west side of Chicago. He was in this bar restaurant because one of his friends works in the kitchen, and occasionally in the evenings, if there's not anybody around, let him come in and we'll feed him a hamburger. So we started talking. I was telling him about this movie that I made, about the one I'm going to make next. Um, and he began to reflect on his own journey. Major grew up on the west side of Chicago, which is known as uh, Chirac. Okay? This is per capita one of the most dangerous places to live in the entire world. Um, 
<clears throat> gangs, drugs, policy run, bad policy run amok. He was born to a mother who was 15 years old. She was a crack addict and a crack dealer. By the time he was 12 years old, he was smoking and selling crack. Okay? Major New knows that he does not have a disease, that he's not a moral failure, okay? That the drug is not necessarily the problem in this equation. How on earth do we expect someone like this, someone like Major, to escape that situation? By pulling himself, himself, himself up by his bootstraps? Okay? You know, that's also an oxidant. That, that, that doesn't exist. You can't actually pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Okay? <laughs> Remember that next time somebody says it. Alright? And so we just started talking. You know, he was telling me about his girlfriend that he's having problems with. He was telling me about this, about trying to get into this treatment program, whatever. Um, you know, and I, and I think he, and, you know, I, get, I bought him a pack of cigarettes and we just sort of walked around and, 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 and talked for a while. And um, it just felt very sad to me. You know, it felt very sad to me to think about me and my privileged white skin, okay? Trying to do a thing like we're trying, all trying to do here. But I'm not major. I'm not major. So after I said goodbye to him that night, he, and I, and I gave him a little bit of money, he was gonna go buy crack. He knew he needed to get clean. He knew he needed that for his relationship, for other things. But he also knew he was going to sleep on the street that night. It's 20 degrees in January in Chicago. Without that hit of crack, he wouldn't have been able to survive. So think about that. Think about the way society views someone like Major. In stark contrast to the reality of his experience. I want to move into our exercise. I call it compassion for addiction. And I want each of you to pair off with one person. I want you to think about a substance or a behavior that you may have a complicated relationship to. It doesn't have to be a drug. It could be gambling, it could be sex, it could be food, whatever you want it to be. And I want you to reflect on when this relationship started and perhaps why. I want you to ask each other about the ways in which it served or served you. And I want you to ask each other about the ways in which it may hurt or harm you. And then finally, I want you to reflect on if this relationship is something you are comfortable with or if it's something you wish to change. Um, but, but I would like to... Uh... But what I would like us to do is come back to the room and, and I want to have you know, a 10-15 minute discussion about, uh, about what came up for you. Okay.